Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It's a great pleasure to have you with us here on the 6th of June 2019. Now, obviously, today, our thoughts are not necessarily focused on the ancient world, but on a period of history much closer to us in time, of course, to the D-Day landing, 6th of June 1944, the largest seaborne invasion in history, and to the incredible courage bravery and sacrifice of so many people on that day and subsequent days. Now, uh, I've been following, as I'm sure you have, some of the coverage of those D-Day uh, uh, services that have been remembering both here in the UK and uh, in France, in Normandy, um, that sacrifice. And I've seen some incredible pictures, including of a 93-year-old who was there at the original D-Day, parachuted in when he was younger. He in actually parachuted again in tandem this time uh, back into Normandy as well. So some absolutely incredible incredible images reminding us of the incredible bravery, the incredible sacrifice, and of course, most importantly, of uh, the need to avoid ever um, uh, such a global conflict ever again. So I think we've all got that in our thoughts today, um, but also thinking about the ancient world and that, thinking about the many battles that were such a commonplace part of everyday life in the ancient Greek and Roman world, and indeed further afield in the ancient world, and how people, the same two and a half thousand years ago, 50, 75 years ago, uh, the same courage, the same bravery, the same sacrifice as they fought, uh, stood and died in many cases for what they believed in. So here we are. Thank you very much indeed for joining me today uh, with a slightly solemn start to the day, uh, to the to the Q&A, but I think one well worth it uh, as ever, as, as we should never stop saying. Uh, we will not forget you or your sacrifice. So everyone, thank you very much indeed. Hello, Alexis. Hello, are you wearing your poppy with pride today? Fantastic. Hello, Patricia. Thank you so much for joining in, everyone. It's great uh, that you could uh, join us today. And of course, it is a prize week today. So we review the questions that have come in and which we've answered, me and my guests have answered uh, over the past couple of weeks. And we choose a prize winner who receives a prize, a copy of my book, Ancient World. So I've been reviewing the questions uh, that we've got through over the last couple of weeks. And there is a winner drum roll for Lorna Donald who asked the question that there's a lot of knife crime going on particularly in the UK at the moment uh, and people are wondering how to respond to and deal with this upsurge in knife crime how did the ancient world deal with this so thank you very much indeed for that Lorna that's absolutely fantastic well done what a great question and it sparked a really interesting discussion and debate uh, with my guest uh, Jess Hughes from the Open University two weeks ago um, so thank you very much for that please do get in touch send us your address to michaelscottacademic at gmail.com and we will get a signed copy of uh, my book out to you. So thank you very much, Dee, for participating. Um, we Also, some of the things on the Facebook page have been absolutely fantastic this week. Uh, I, I, I put out a, a picture of one of the questions that I'd set in my ancient global history exam uh, very recently for students of mine at Warwick University. And that was of a piece of, uh, it was a drawing of a piece of Chinese silk that had been found in Palmyra, uh, which is uh, kind of in today in modern day Syria, but was at the edge of the Roman Empire as a trading caravan outpost linking into the Silk Roads. And on this uh, piece of silk that was found in a grave in Palmyra was images of, well, uh, kind of that was the question. People were coming up with responses. Some people getting it in terms of uh, it was grapes and harvesting of grapes with camels, two humped camels uh, in the background, um, and others coming up with some absolutely genius ideas about what uh, these, might, uh, these images might actually be. And I absolutely love your responses. So I'm going to have a look through all those responses and, come and, and write a kind of considered response to you all that will flag up on the Facebook page. So keep an eye out for that. And also, may I congratulate you on my on the extraordinary number of comments and engagements over the Centaur's trousers on the Facebook page. Absolutely extraordinary. If you haven't seen this yet, go to facebook.com forward slash Michael Scott Academic. And there's a brilliant picture. There are four options in how a Centaur, if he were to choose to do so, should wear his trousers. And you all had extremely strong opinions. Fantastic fantastic opinions about how a centaur should wear his trousers. Hello Fiona, how are you doing? Thank you so much indeed for joining in. That's absolutely fantastic. Thank you for taking the time on a work break. Fantastic. That's really great. Um, so yes, go and have a look at centaur's trousers and absolutely congratulations for your fantastic responses that have me belly aching half the time um, about some of the, uh, the tactful ways in which we, you were 
talking about how the centaur could best display or not display his manhood. Um, so we're moving on to, though, to some proper questions that have been coming in for this Q&A. Uh, and first off, catching up from one that came in last time while we were on live, but I didn't have a chance to answer. That's from Genevieve Scully, asking about whether there are any votive offerings. Remember when I was, we were, had Jess Hughes from the Open University, whose specialty subject is votive offerings. Uh, on We were discussing votive offerings for all sorts of different things, and particularly for illnesses and for health. Um, <clears throat> but Genevieve's asking about whether there's any related to marriage relationships uh, or worries. Hi, Docker, how are you doing? Good to see you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, now, this is really interesting. Now, I, I haven't had a chance to have a chat with Jess about this, and I've been racking my brains to think about whether I know any votive offerings that are specifically and obviously related to relationship worries, and I can't. Um, but we'll come back to you on whether we ha have any uh, th further thoughts on that. But the one thing I did want to flag with you is that if we move over into the area of uh, questions asked to oracles, and we go to Dodona up in northern Greece, where the way in which you asked an oracle involved you actually writing down your question uh, and on a small little piece of metal and then actually burying it in the sanctuary. So we have the actual questions asked by people of the Oracle of Zeus at Dodona in northern Greece two and a half thousand years ago. There we do have examples of relationship worries uh, and other familial queries coming in and being part and parcel of the stuff that was asked of the Oracle. So, um, you know, we have Dodona tablets that ask the question, should I get married to X uh, or not? Alongside questions like, you know, shall I sell my sheep? Did Thorpion steal the silver? And perhaps again, a kind of uh, a, a question that will be familiar to dads out there, uh, dads particularly of daughters. Uh, there was a question asked at Dodona, how do I best keep my daughter safe? Uh, so kind of, there you go, kind of some of the concerns that have not changed at all over two and a half thousand years. Hello, Linda. Hello, Judith. Thank you so much for tuning in and joining this, the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. So we move on to another question that came in over the week. Um, Sarah Scotty asked, uh, she's an OU English Lit student and asking, loves to study the classics, but doesn't kind of feel that she's able to learn the ancient languages. Is there a way of learning without having to learn another language? Absolutely, Sarah. Studying the ancient text is not something that you can only do if you're doing it in the ancient Greek or Latin. Absolutely. Kind of people are engaging with these texts all the time through translation uh, and then in through, indeed through the kind of lots of different representations of those texts that have been done uh, over time by different authors leading all the way through to books like Stephen Fry's Mythos most recently etc. So there is absolutely nothing stopping you from studying these texts and gaining a huge insight both into them as works of literature but also uh, into what they can tell us about the cultures that they were created in. Hello Hugh, hello Alexis, how are you doing? The whisking oaks of Dodona, Alexis says, absolutely the weird and wacky and wonderful ways in which you consulted the oracle at Dodona in which the priests apparently listened to the whispering of the leaves of the sacred tree in order to come up with the gods' responses. Thank you very much indeed for that question, Sarah. So yeah, absolutely, get on. And you asked another one. Can Sarah have two questions today? I think she can. It's soon going to be exam time. Do you have any advice for revision and on the day? Well, yes, it is absolutely exam time, Sarah. Hello, Sam, how are you doing? Hello, Alexis, kind of whispering, <laughs> whistling, whispering, uh, somewhere between the two, Alexis. Um, but yes, questions about revision. Yeah, we're full in exam season uh, at the University of Warwick. A lot of my students have been sitting exams over the past couple of weeks. And indeed, I've been invigilating exams. I was invigilating yesterday in Warwick for a, a, an exam um, and sort of seeing kind of, you know, going through that process again and seeing the students having taken so much time and effort to get themselves ready for that one moment when they have to walk in through the door, turn over a paper and give it their best for two or three hours. It is an absolutely tough call. So what would be my advice for those of you still sitting exams um, for this season. Well, in terms of revision, you, I think it's really important that you do your best to inform yourself about what kind of exam and what kinds of questions are normally asked so that you can then target your revision. So absolutely, you should be looking at past papers. You should be asking if there are any sample answers that you could be looking at from past papers, really getting it clear with the module conveners, if you possibly can, about what it is that they're looking for in the exam. And then, you know, you want to be taking a targeted approach to revision. It is in an ideal world, of course, we would be revising everything, but it's very unlikely that people are going to have the time to do that. So I always suggest trying to uh, create, you know, depending on how many questions you've got to answer in the exam, double that and add some more uh, numbers of topics um, that you're going to revise. 
And then those are your big revision topics that hopefully should cover you for kind of questions as they come up in the exam. And then for each of those revision topics, you want to have subsections. So you want to have a little bit of, and make sure you know the nuts and bolts of what's actually going on when. A little bit about the, the primary sources. So kind of what are the primary sources telling us? You don't normally have to actually learn by rote quotes or names or reference numbers for the primary sources. But if you can throw in some of the authors that are talking about particular points, that's great. Uh, then also thinking about the secondary scholarship. So what are uh, the secondary sources talking about and saying is important about this particular issue or not? What are the sides of the arguments that you might uh, put forward? Um, and then crucially, what do you think about it? Right? What's your view? What's your opinion? And finally, also think about how your topic might connect into different kinds of questions. You, know, you might not get a question in your exam that's specifically on the topic that you've revised, but can you use that information somehow to answer a different question? So doing that thinking before you go in um, about the different ways in which your topics relate to other topics and other issues that you've studied in your subject, really important. And then when you get into the exam on the day, the only thing you need to remember if uh, this is for an arts exam, kind of arts and humanities exam where you're doing essay questions, is that you must answer the precise question set. Right? The number of people, hello Susie, how are you doing? The number of people who see a question and think, oh, it's about that, and then they quickly write out their, their stock answer about that topic, and it never works, because what their markers are just looking for is that you've understood the precise terms of the precise question set on the exam paper, and you've offered an answer to that exact question. So in your introduction in essays, always define any ambiguous terms in the question and lay out exactly how you're gonna answer it, and then go ahead and answer it, and then in your conclusion, tell, say what you've said. You know, it kind of is, it is absolutely not rocket science. An exam essay should tell, tell me what you're gonna tell me in the introduction, tell me in the middle, and then tell me what you've told me at the end. So those are my tips for revising Sarah for the exams. Hello, Anthony. Hello, Susie. Thank you so much for joining in. Um, and Linda, you've asked a question. Linda Montague has asked a question. So, and I should say before we move on, good luck to everyone who's taking an exam or has taken an exam this summer and is now waiting nervously for the results. I'm sure you have done brilliantly. So Linda, uh, you asked a question about if you could travel back in time to ancient Greece and be a person of influence, what would you change if you could? Oof, tough question. Well, I asked that to you all as well. You know, if you could go back in time and change a moment in history, what would it be? Right? And how and why would you choose the thing that you chose? Um, obviously, we can never know what happens right? if we change a moment in history. What are the ramifications of that change going to be? But I guess uh, kind of one of the things that I would like to at least have a chance to do is go back to ancient Athens in 399 BCE and try and have a word with Socrates. Uh, not uh, to tell him to escape uh, after he'd been uh, sentenced to death, because we know people tried to tell him that and he absolutely didn't uh, take the advice. He decided that he wanted to uh, not abscond from the city. Uh, he didn't believe that they dealt with him fairly, but he was not going to abscond from the rule of the city. But could you have got to Socrates a little bit earlier, perhaps before he put forward his suggestion to the jury um, of how he should be treated? So if you remember back in the courts of ancient Athens, you were first tried to see whether you were guilty or not guilty of the particular crime by a jury and then if you were found guilty, both sides got to submit a recommendation for what the punishment should be and the jury pretty much had to choose one of those two options. They didn't have a free hand. Uh, and famously, Socrates, kind of what well, the accusers asked for death and Socrates came in and went, no, you know what, actually, I think you should uh, kind of basically pay for my entire lifestyle because I'm a really good thing for the city, um, keeping you all on your toes. Uh, and but with those two options, on the plate, the jury chose death. So, but if I could change anything, I'd probably go back and try and convince Socrates to maybe not go back in with such a tongue in cheek uh, suggestion of punishment. Because if he'd put something down like uh, exile or a huge fine or something like that, he would probably not have been sentenced to death. So, there you go. Uh, Linda, thank you. You're going to send me your time machine. Very handy indeed. Very handy indeed. I don't think I've got a huge chance of convincing Socrates somehow uh, of my plan. I suspect he was a man who was uh, quite difficult to convince uh, to do anything else than he thought he should do. 
But uh, anyway, I kind of I hope uh, that, that that might uh, kind of work. And tell me, you know, let us know now live or indeed over the Facebook page over the following week, if you could change a moment in time, what would it be and why? Um, brilliant. So thank you so much for those questions that come in. We'll take a quick break from questions to talk about what's in the news. Uh, we do this every week. So uh, the kind of the classics, different things to do with the ancient world that are in the news. Also, we do a section about what's on, kind of different exhibitions and events going on. And then we have some recommendations for you, books uh, are, that, that people have uh, suggested in. And we've got some of those today. So in the news, one of Egypt's oldest, oldest Christian churches, dating back to the fourth century was found hidden behind an ancient basilica wall. So this has been discovered by Polish archaeologists who've discovered a 4th century church in Egypt. This could be one of the oldest Christian churches uh, found. Uh, they found it in the port of Morea, which is near the city of Alexandria. Um, and indeed, they found a basilica, a buried chapel and a large collection of ceramic fragments. So watch this space for more, but that's fantastic. Um, then we've also kind of, uh, well, not quite so much closer to home, but a tiny bit closer to home in Italy, uh, in the Forum. You'd think that nothing more could be found in the Forum. Surely they've been digging it up for quite some time, but oh, believe me, there's still tons to find. Uh, ancient marble head of Dionysus was discovered near the Roman Forum kind of from Rome's imperial age, showing Dionysus oh, well, kind of as Bacchus, as the Roman god of wine, music and dance, uh, discovered in the heart of the city uh, during excavations last week. Um, and it had been reused to form part of a medieval wall. Poor old Dionysus, kind of there he was resplendent in a sculpture. And then at some point his head got knocked off and it got put into a wall instead. Um, but the experts are saying the head is in fantastic condition. So clearly those builders were doing uh, a kind job of putting his head nicely cemented into the wall and who, how did they know, uh, protecting it to survive for 2000 years as a result. That's great. Over to Delos back in Greece, so a little bit further away. Uh, now, of course, Delos, we've been thinking about a little bit since we've been having our debates uh, about whether or not modern sculptures should be placed uh, in amongst the ancient ruins on Delos. But again, more news from the Delos Open Museum Restoration Project. And the Ministry of Culture and Sports has presented a comprehensive plan for the protection and enhancement of the archaeological site of Delos. So kind of look out for more changes there. And I cannot recommend it enough. If you get a chance to get to Delos, take it. It is an extraordinary ancient site. It does involve a trip to Mykonos. Uh, so you go to Mykonos, maybe have a few days on Mykonos. And then when you've recovered and your hangover is not too bad, take a boat uh, from the harbour in Mykonos and go round to Delos, where you can only spend the day and then you have to get off the island by about four o'clock in the afternoon afternoon because the island is shut to visitors after four o'clock. No one lives on the island bar, uh, the archaeological site personnel, um, and if you are linked to the French excavation hut uh, that's there and the French excavators on the site, which I was very, very lucky enough once upon a time to do, and actually slept overnight on Delos. Um, using the time machine, says Alexis, maybe go back and tell Pandora not to open that flipping box. Well... But what was the last thing kind of to scramble just about after, out of that box? It was hope. So, you know, there were some, some good to come of it as well. Um, but I think that's a brilliant one. Thanks, Alexis, for that. Linda, you'd warn the Gauls in France that Julius Caesar on his way to change their defence and attack tactics. Do you think that would work? Do you think anything would have stopped Julius Caesar? Absolutely brilliant. Uh, do you think the Gauls would have gone done anything except gone, ha! Really? Whatever. Bring it on, Julius. Kind of one way or t'other. Thank you so much for those ideas. Absolutely fantastic. A couple more pieces of news to fit in. Uh, we're coming to Britain now. Uh, and uh, here, a large Roman building has been uncovered at Abbey Farm in Faversham, which is absolutely fantastic. Kind of here again, even on our shores, uh, kind of lots of stuff being discovered all the time. It's an absolutely extraordinary building, uh, 150 foot long by 50 foot wide, divided into zones of activity. So there was a bathhouse, with a furnace but then as you move east it seems to be more um, kind of being used for agricultural activity so a multi-purpose uh, sort of sports center with garage esque sort of thing has been found out at Faversham so that looks absolutely brilliant what's on moving on to what's on well first off if you are anywhere near Oxford at the Simpkins Lee Theatre Lady Margaret Hall next Saturday the 15th of June 7 to 9 p.m then you must get in to see the songs of arms and a man kind of with Emma Kirby uh, Matthew Hargreaves Elizabeth Donnelly and Llewellyn Morgan Llewellyn Morgan very close to my heart as a professor who taught me uh, once upon a time in the 
past. Come and hear one of our older stories of refugees escaping across the Mediterranean to find a new home and build a new city. This is Rome. This is an ancient tale with a modern resonance told by the greatest of poets, Virgil. Yes, their version of the Aeneid. Absolutely fantastic. If you are up in the north near Vindolanda, you want to get in to their regular lectures that are happening over the summer. So there's one on the 13th of June, which is about frontier artefacts, Romano-British glass bangles at Vindolanda. It's been given by Tatiana Velva. Uh, Wednesday, July 3rd, Elizabeth Green is talking about the Vindolanda archaeological leather project, kind of all the leather that's amazingly survived in the conditions up at Vindolanda. And on August the 7th, Robert Hefford will be talking about the chemistry of Vindolanda. So all those lectures start at 7 p.m. Do get a chance uh, to go and drop in on those. Um, and of course, if we can have one thing happening in Warwick that I want to flag with you as well, it's our 1st of July Teachers' Day. So if you're a teacher out there teaching GCSE or A-level classical civilization or ancient history, this is the day for you that we're putting on specifically for teachers. There are a couple of places left, um, but and there are bursaries available also to help with travel costs to come and join us, where there'll be a series of lectures by different staff members through the day, including me. I'll be there talking about Greek religion, linked to the different module topics of the GCSE and A-level syllabus. So we're there to help you uh, with questions you might have about the syllabus, help you with those aspects of the modern scholarship and kind of different scholarly directions the subject is taking, um, and also to answer any of your questions. So do come along and join us on the 1st of July. If you want to sign up, go to www.warwick.ac.uk forward slash WCN. Absolutely fantastic. And then what's new in terms of books, kind of, I must flag this with you. We put it on the Facebook page as well, but The Battle Between the Frogs and Mice, there's a new translation coming out this autumn. Now you may not have heard of this, but this is actually an ancient text. It's a sort of mini piss take epic. Um, it was written kind of, kind of on into the Hellenistic period um, where kind of it's a tumultuous epic battle uh, but between frogs and mice um, and it's absolutely brilliant and it's well well worth this new translation coming out by EU Stallings um, so can't wait to have a look at that get that uh, on order um, I was at the book launch of Daisy Dunn's latest book in the shadow of, of Vesuvius the life of Pliny that's now out in all good bookshops so do have a look at that, uh, that. it's brilliantly uh, cast through the kind of lens of the eruptions at Pompeii covering Pompeii and Herculaneum but thinking about a little bit the life of the elder Pliny but mostly focused on the life of the younger Pliny he who would go on to have have uh, sort of governor controlships out in places like Bithynia out in the east where he wrote back to the Emperor Trajan asking what to do with these pesky Christians who just don't want to follow the rules um, and Trajan famously writing back going look if uh, if you can kind of sweep it under the carpet and just leave them be do um, kind of try and make sure make it not a big hoo-ha uh, kind of very sensible sensible advice from the Emperor Trajan there um, also to flag from the Warwick Classics Network we've got a new Ask an Academic video out by Dr Claire Rowan who's talking about the age of Augustus on coins. So again you can have a look at that through www.warwick.ac.uk forward slash WCN um, and I'm up next so I'm going to be talking about Greek religion. We're going to be recording that over the next uh, couple of weeks and then it will be released to you fairly soon after that. So if you want to ask me any questions about Greek religion that I'll answer as part of the Ask an Academic uh, uh, Warwick Classics Network video particularly focused for teachers and for pupils in schools um, if your students are out there uh, kind of and you want to get clubbed together as a class lesson and come up with some questions that you want to ask me about Greek religion do send them in you can either send them in to me direct uh, or through the Facebook page or via the Warwick Classics Network there's a contact email there for the Warwick Classics Network research fellow Paul Grigsby and we will uh, answer them as part of the video okay we've got some time for a couple more questions hello Alexis go yeah hello John thank you very much indeed for tuning in that's absolutely fantastic great that you could be here we had a question from Alexandra Sills, who is currently, all right, this is quite jealous making now, she's currently out digging on Despotico with Birkbeck University, um, and she'd love some thoughts about archaic cycladic sanctuaries to, well, she asked us to get her in the mood before she went, but hopefully she might be listening in or be able to tune in at some point after a hard day excavating in the sun. Now, Despotico kind of is a tiny island off Antiparos, which is itself a small island off the Cycladic island of Paros. Um, so we're on a, a pretty remote location out in the middle of the Aegean and also a pretty amazing, gorgeous one. Paros and Antiparos are both absolutely beautiful and despotic, although I've never visited personally. 
Absolutely fantastic. But this is the site of a sanctuary of Apollo around about the 8th century, uh, 8th century temple, lots of kind of uh, everyday material has been discovered. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, and kind of, I, I guess my thought about archaic cycladic sanctuaries would be how, for how long we have underestimated the degree of connectivity between islands um, at early, early stages that, you know, we see this happening all the time in later phases and we're kind of used to that. Um, but even in these early phases, in the archaic period kind of huge amounts of connectivity of movement of peoples and goods in between these islands the dance of the islands as it was so beautifully put in the title of the book by Christy Constantopoulos by uh, insularity and, and, and island interaction um, so it kind of I think that's my kind of thought about archaic cycle that we must never estimate underestimate the amount of interactions that are going on and it would be lovely Alexander if you could report back on what your findings were from this season's excavations at Despotico when you get a chance when you take off your sunglasses and stop uh, some bathing when you've got a spare moment from excavation and you come back to the real world from the heart of the Aegean do let us know uh, we won't be too jealous when you let us know uh, what the finds of this season were um, kind of then ah Paul Mangan here we go we've got a question here about Herodotus um, kind of coming in saying Herodotus was a barbarian lover when he wrote his history did Aeschylus receive a similar response for his sympathetic sympathetic portrayal of the Persians in his play The Persians. So Paul, really interesting question about uh, those responsible supposedly for writing history. Herodotus, using that word in Greek, it's historia, our word history, but it means an investigation, uh, and then playwrights like Aeschylus. But the, the crucial thing I think we need to tease apart here is actually the timings. Because Herodotus writing at the end of the 5th century in about the 420s and Aeschylus writing back at well, kind of where he stood kind of at the Battle uh, of Marathon and then kind of was a playwright in the years after that. So in the uh, late, uh, in the 470s and the 460s. Um, Herodotus gets called a barbarian lover, but it's not actually at the time he's writing. It's centuries later uh, in the work of Plutarch, who actually writes a text called On the Malice of Herodotus, accusing him at that stage of being a philobarbaros, a barbarian lover, as if it's a bad thing. But that's not necessarily the reputation that Herodotus' history has at the time. Um, and, you know, kind of, I mean, his, his history, you can see exactly why Plutarch later kind of labelled him as, a, as kind of not taking a side, um, because the very opening of Herodotus' history uh, is this famous line, you know, so he, he launches his historia, his inquiry, so that things may not be forgotten in time that are both great and marvellous, some by Greeks, some by barbarians, right? um, and so that they may not lose their glory. So in that very opening paragraph, he's kind of equating the fact that barbarians can do great and marvellous things just as much as Greeks do. And if kind of, you follow that through the narrative of Herodotus, he's constantly looking at other groups outside of the kind of core Greek world. And sometimes the stuff they get up to it ends up being an example for how not to do things and how they've got it wrong and they've misunderstood something. But equally, half the time, those examples are there to kind of provoke the question of, hang on a second, are we sure uh, about where the boundary between civilization and barbarism lies? And of course, barbar at that stage was simply meaning that they don't speak Greek. It didn't necessarily have the kind of um, connotations of inferiority that it later comes to have by the time you get into uh, kind of writers like Plutarch where kind of historians were very much supposed to more bolster kind of what's happening within their world and I think we've, we've struggled to get out of that um, for centuries as a result of that this idea that history is somehow supposed to um, always tell a shining story about those um, immediately around the historian and kind of equate uh, higher and better and more civilized civilizations and, and pit them against lesser civilized ones. Um, so Aeschylus, interestingly, Aeschylus writing back in the, the, the play The Persians coming up in the 470s in the immediate aftermath of here, the, 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 the refuted Persian invasions is actually, interestingly, often thought about as a key moment um, where the idea of barbarism is beginning, or at least for the Persians, the portrayal of the Persians is beginning to take on negative inferior connotations. So in the immediate aftermath of that victory when they repulsed the Persians, in Aeschylus's Persian play, you get to see in a very effeminate uh, personification of the Persian ruler. Um, and this idea, this gab begins to gather speed after that date 
after Aeschylus' Persians, uh, that there is somehow some kind of real cultural uh, difference and, and kind of superiority and inferiority between the Greeks and Persians. So, uh, kind of, you've got Aeschylus' Persians uh, putting that, um, starting to get that, that, that kind of difference between these two worlds really uh, working. You've got Herodotus writing at the end of the 5th century, trying to sort of almost um, push back against that. And then centuries later, you've got people like Plutarch calling him a, a lover of barbarians and that, that not being a compliment. Hello, hello, John, how are you doing? Thank you so much for joining us from Porta Traiana from the Trajan. Yay, kind of get Trajan in there once again. So we are kind of running out of time. I'm so sorry, I've got lots more questions um, to think about uh, kind of that I wanted to get to, but I will save them for next time. So a, a few final thoughts uh, from me. Um, kind of where are we coming uh, next week? Uh, next time, I won't be here next Thursday, the 13th of June, um, because I am taking a day with my little three-year-old daughter and we are going to go and run amok uh, around town together um, so I will be back the week after that which is Thursday the 20th of June four o'clock as always please send in your questions uh, to the Facebook page facebook.com forward slash Michael Scott Academic or director Michael Scott Academic at gmail.com uh, and we look forward to seeing you on the 20th of June so everyone have an absolutely fantastic rest of the week I hope the sunshine continues to shine for you all all take a moment please 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 do to remember uh, the 6th of June 1944 and the extraordinary bravery and sacrifice of those involved in the D-Day landings and indeed to remember the courage and sacrifice of those who have to stand in war uh, all around the world at all times um, and uh, then a kind of also uh, kind of do let me know what you think about those centaurs trousers and I'll be getting back to you on the Facebook page with my thoughts uh, kind of with all your responses to the ancient global history exam question over the next couple of days so have a lovely rest of the week and a weekend and we'll see you on the 20th of June take care